Colossians 1. I'm going to keep going through the book of Colossians here. Colossians 1. Um, I want to actually move through Colossians a little bit slower than I am everything else. Daniel, um, which Lord willing next Sunday night will we'll pick up since I'll cancel tonight's service. Um, Daniel, I'm trying to move through it pretty quickly other than dealing with the end time stuff. I'm doing Daniel 7, Daniel uh, 8, Daniel 9. Those chapters would be slower, but I'll be doing Daniel 3 like I did, just one service. Daniel 4 in one sermon, Daniel 5, Daniel 6 in one sermon. But with the book of Colossians, I'm going to go verse by verse instead of chapter by chapter and uh, really take small bites, as they would say, and uh, kind of dig in and look around at what we would go to naturally from a Bible study. Like if you were reading Colossians at home by yourself, what are scriptures and ideas and trains of thought that that God might lead you down a road as you're reading through this book. And that's kind of how I'm taking it. I'm not looking into the etymology and the, the definition of every single word and breaking it down like one of these cold Calvinists would. But instead, I'm just following it out as God guides and, and study and you know, taking these things that Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I'm bringing them out throughout the scripture. And so... Just going verse by verse slowly through that. I'm going to go ahead and read in Colossians 1 here and catch us up. And then I'll read the verses that I'm going to cover today. So we'll be doing with verses 1 to 6. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in, Je in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth and so last time I, I talked a lot about Paul and about the Colossian church's background this time we're going to start getting into what he's actually saying and he, he Paul begins the letter off here with a uh, spirit of thankfulness he's thankful for this church and oftentimes uh, that's the the attitude he has when he when he writes one of these epistles is his thankfulness toward the church and he's pr he says he's praying for these people with thanks he's so he's going to God in prayer and he's saying Thank you, God, for these good people, for these people. And it says particularly that he's heard of their love. So he's praying with thanks to God. He's really grateful for this church full of people that actually love God, that are actually, you know, they're going there and worshiping the Lord. They're singing praise to God. They understand the grace of God and truth, as he says. And he says he's heard of their love. And that love is that which accompanies faith. And uh, as we're all here Christians today, I believe, you know, we, we, we all know that love that we got when we first got saved. We all know the love that still abides in us. That thing that causes us to look on our neighbor or somebody we know and to say, I wish they were saved. Or we'll look on somebody around us and we'll say, I have a little something I can help you with. Here, I'm going to give this to you. It's that love that Paul heard about. And it, how did he hear about their love? He heard about their love for God, for sure, their love for Jesus, their love for one another. But... That love is something that Christians really can't hide. If you are a Christian, you, you people will know of your love. It's a love for another person that leads you to witness. It leads you to give. It leads you to help people, and it leads you to sacrifice for people. It leads you to, to lay down your life for another person. It leads you to do a multitude of things, and it's that love that other people look on Christians and see in us because it's just abounding in our lives in different ways. Nobody's perfect with that. And love is not to the detriment of hate. I love babies and I hate abortion. There are things to hate and hate has a place. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to love and a time to hate. And so hate has a place. Uh, you don't want to go too far like contemporary Christianity in a lot of ways. But love is the mark of a Christian. I think primarily through witnessing and then you go on down through uh, self-sacrifice, helping and giving in different ways. Maybe the most specific way I think love manifests itself though for a christian 
is through witnessing. And Paul here talks about that, and he says that they have a hope. And witnessing of the hope that we all have, you know, uh, it, it really is as simple as this. We are all on our way naturally to hell. We're all uh, dead in our sins and trespasses. We're all guilty before God. We're all on our way to hell. Uh, we're not born children of God. We're born children of Adam. And uh, some people become children of the devil. And uh, if we stay in our sin, we'll, we'll also uh, join the devil in the lake of fire one day. And that uh, sin that's going to take us there is bad news. And the good news is, and the hope that we have is that we will actually escape that. And the good news is, and the hope is, is that we're not all doomed. Um, f the fear of hell is a healthy fear for someone who is not saved. But for a Christian, we have no fear of hell. Why? Because we have, as Paul says in verse 5, he says, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And uh, that's what I want to kind of talk about here a little bit is the hope that's laid up for us in heaven. And it's something I think uh, the Bible says to set your mind on things above. We talk about this coronavirus stuff. And we're all trying to be wary and different churches do their own thing. Uh, some churches shut down for the whole year back in June uh, or even before that. Uh, some churches are making people wear masks. Masks don't do anything. I looked up a scientific studies and it's just political. Uh, some people say social distance. Well, if you're in a room and someone actually has it, you're probably all going to get it. I mean, at the end of the day, there has to be a level of trust in the Lord and wisdom employed. And I trust God to protect me. I, I really do. I think if you come into church with a sincere heart, I don't think God's going to strike you down dead for it. Now, that don't mean trials and tribulations ain't going to come. That don't mean you might not get, you might actually get sick one day. But when it does come, guess what? If the Lord allows it, you have a hope laid up for you in heaven. And this is the attitude I think Christians ought to have. There's many reasons around the world today that Christians could use to not attend a church or to not worship God. And, and it's just, it's sad to me uh, that, you know, we can be wise and we can <clears throat> take, you know, uh, opportunities to, you know, not be uh, stupid about things. But there's Christians around the world today that are literally killed by Muslims just for attending a church or something. And so you have to be uh, wise, but you also have to not be uh, scared of that which is not something to be scared of. We need to be wise, and we also need to trust the Lord. And the hope that we have laid up in heaven is ultimately the thing that I think we should all fall back on. Because while everything might be, uh, you know, unknown, 2020 presidential election still ain't totally concluded, you know. <clears throat> There's so many things that, that are unknown this year, and I, I, I agree with another pastor I heard preach. I don't think 2021 is going to be much better, especially if Joe Biden gets in there. Who knows what's going to happen? And so it don't look like it's getting better anytime soon, and there's so many unknowns. And so that's why the Bible says, set your mind on things above. Because on things below, the, there's so many unknowns. There's so many things you don't know what tomorrow brings. And Jesus even told people, don't worry about tomorrow. The today has enough trouble in itself. There's, there's enough to worry about in just one day. And so we ought to be concerned with just today, and we ought to set our mind on things above, on the hope that is uh, <clears throat> laid up for us in heaven. In Ephesians 1, the first thing I thought about when I thought about the hope laid up for us, Ephesians 1, everybody knows that. Paul breaks out into praise and thanks to God. He says in his prayers he's been giving thanks and asking that God may give us eyes of understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. It says, uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 4, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, uh, O God, beside thee, what he hath pre uh, prepared for him that waiteth for him. And then as I, Isaiah 65, 17 says, for behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And so within just one chapter of that statement, you know, everybody's heard that, and it's quoted in the New Testament, my eyes not seen, ears not heard, what God has prepared for us. Uh, right after making that statement, really, it's in the same prophecy. It was one chapter over. God describes a new heaven and new earth. And guess what? Eye hasn't seen, and ear hasn't really heard about very much, uh, at least, about the new heaven and new earth. We know it's going to exist, but we don't know what it's going to look like. Nobody's seen it because it doesn't exist yet. But in the mind of God, he, he knows what it's going to be like. God knows what he has in store for us. That is a hope laid up for us, a, a future resurrection body, a future body and a future new planet and a new uh, 
a new heaven, a new earth is something amazing to look forward to. Revelation 21 and 22, if you want, you say, I want to know more about the new heaven, new earth. Really, the totality of what we know about the new heaven, new earth, almost totally comes from Revelation 21 and 22. And it's not a whole lot, but that is our future hope. And somebody says, you know, well, what hope of what? It's a hope, really, of eternal life. What is the hope laid up for us? The hope for us is life eternal. And this is all throughout the Bible. I, I, could, I could literally spend the next 30 minutes reading scriptures talking about eternal life. Uh, everybody knows John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life, eternal life. Life never ending is the hope of the gospel. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says, And these shall go, into, uh, go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, into life eternal. And so there's everlasting, never ending punishment for the wicked and those who aren't saved. But the hope laid up for a Christian is life eternal, life never ending. Luke 18, 29 and 30 says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. And Jesus, Jesus promised routinely during his ministry, uh, life everlasting, life that never ended. That is the thing we all worry about when we talk about this coronavirus. Isn't that what everybody's ultimately afraid of? Even though there's a 0.1% chance they'll actually be, be killed by it, everybody's ultimately afraid they or a loved one will die from it. And yet the promise we have of the gospel is life never ending. You will, if you are a Christian, you will not have an end to your life. Now, your physical life now may die, but you will never truly die. There is uh, no second death for you. John 4, 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the, uh, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life Romans 6 22 but now being made free from sin and become servants to God you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life everlasting life all throughout the Bible life eternal uh, as Jesus said Galatians 6 8 for he that soweth his flesh shall also reap uh, his the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting the Bible talks about over and over again Hey, there ain't nothing you've given up. You've not left your home or given up your job or given up this or given up money or given up your time. You're not truly giving up anything because you're gaining everything. You're not truly losing anything if you must even lose your life for Christ because you have life eternal. Uh, here it says if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, guess what? You have everlasting life. The things you do for God, that is the only thing at the end of the day that matters. Everything else perishes. Everything else is burnt up in flames before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16 Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Christ, uh, Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What's the way to life everlasting? Believing on him. Over and over again the Bible is clear. But life eternal and eternal life is not just long life. It's not just a type of life, it's everlasting life. It's life that never ends. And that is the Christian hope. That's the hope laid up for us. And you should make no mistake about it. It blows me away when I, walk, uh, I talk to people who have never heard of the resurrection. That's, the, that's a Christian hope. If you've never heard of the resurrection, not number one, of Jesus Christ, but number two, of believers, that is the Christian hope, that we will be resurrected unto life eternal one day. So there's these promises and there's these truths here. When we talk about this hope, I'm going to shift into this now. I want to look here at these different categories of people and the hope that they have, the positive and negative. So first, for the saved, you say, well, where does it talk about this? When does this happen for us? Well, the easiest place to put you in would be 1 Thessalonians 4. Everybody knows the verses, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. This is the primary uh, rapture, uh, rapture uh, text in the scripture. The Bible says, For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then 
we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's what the word in, in the, uh, Latin is rapturo or rapizo. Rapture is where we get that. That's where we get that word rapture, right? To be caught up. That's what rapture means, to be snatched away or to be caught up. Those who are alive and remain on earth at this time will be caught up with the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you'll be changed. You'll be made like him. That's when you get your new body as a Christian uh, in this dispensation. That is the resurrection that we have. And it says that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's not a time when you won't be with the Lord after that. There's not a time when you'll, oh, I feel distant from the Lord today, or I just feel like I've backslidden a little bit, or I feel like I'm not, you know, as spiritual today as I might, or I just don't feel like I'm walking with the Lord as I should. There won't be a day after that that you won't walk with the Lord. You'll be with the Lord, it says, forevermore, everlasting. But that's not the only resurrection the Bible speaks of, <clears throat> of, of the hope that we have uh, in front of us. There's also uh, the truth of the resurrection. You can turn to Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to read from Daniel 12 while you turn to Revelation 20. And there's, <clears throat> there's two texts here that really speak to this resurrection of the tribulation saints and Israel. So when we talk about the future hope that we have, that's really what we're digging down into a little bit, doing a bit of a Bible study on it and, and following this thought out. We have a future hope laid up for us, eternal life, life that never ends, resurrection bodies, new heaven and new earth. Well, when does this happen? Well, for Christians, it begins ultimately with a rapture. But what about the Jews? And what about people who are here for that tribulation period? There's two scriptures particularly that I know of that speak to this. Number, one of them is where you're at. Listen to this out of Daniel 12 while you're there. The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, that, uh, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, that's talking about the tribulation period, such as never was since, uh, since there was a nation even to that same time. And so there's a tribulation and there's great tribulation within the tribulation period. There's a small period of time within the seven-year period of tribulation that's called the Great Tribulation. And at that time, it says the Bible, Michael the archangel stands up, and it says all this goes down. It says there's going to be a great time of trouble. And it says right here, it says, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Now, who is that in context? It's Israel. Israel gets saved. Everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so what, this is the second, ju this is the second, re uh, second judgment, you could say. Uh, I don't want to put it that way. This is called the sheep goat judgment. We'll put it that way. So you have the beam of seat judgment, which is the first judgment. The second judgment is the sheep goat judgment. And the third judgment is the great white throne judgment. This is the first resurrection, t uh, technically, though. The Bible doesn't call the rapture necessarily a resurrection. It calls this the first resurrection in the text that you're at in Revelation 20. So this right here is technically the second judgment because already before the tribulation period, the Christians had the judgment seat of uh, Christ. And now it says at the sheep goat judgment, you say, I want to read more about that. Read Matthew 25. <clears throat> Jesus now at the end of the tribulation period separates the sheep from the goats and cast some people into hell and the rest go into the millennial kingdom. That's what it's talking about here. And, and here it actually talks about the resurrection of Israel. That's what I believe that's talking about. Now in Revelation 20, starting at verse 1, we're going to get more detail on what happens here because we know Revelation 20, this is the, definitively the end of the tribulation period. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of on the dragon, that, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now watch this. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ. This is what we call tribulation saints. 
These are people which I believe very well soon we're going to see stuff like this start taking place. The system is becoming implemented and they're pushing for a one world government. They're pushing for, uh, uh, I've seen Justin Trudeau or whatever, the Canadian prime minister guy. He's kind of like a fairy. He's kind of weird and effeminate. He, I've seen him talking about a new world order and we need to move to this new world order. And uh, you see uh, people in our government, Chuck Schumer or whatever that guy's name is, they want, we'll win Georgia, and then we'll change America, and then we'll change the world. He's a little dweeb, you know, but that's what he, it's the way he said it. They want to change America. They want to change the world. They want to transition into a one-world government, a cashless society. You, you notice in the last year, there's a shortage of change. You, you go to any of your, you know, I go to Dad's truck. There ain't a shortage of change in his truck. You know, where'd the change go? You know, he, you can dig change for four hours out of his truck or something, you know. It used to be a thing. Clean out my truck and I'll give you, you know, a two pounds of, of coins or something. There's just so many coins. I guarantee you ain't the only one. There ain't a shortage of coins. It's, a, it's this created, concocted, fanciful thing to move away from cash and, and physical money to a cashless society. Uh, you see this year, uh, they won't serve you if you don't have a mask on in some subways. I see videos of people getting thrown out of stores for not wearing masks. You don't comply with what they say, we won't serve you. It's preparing the people to when they say, hey, if you don't have the mark of the beast, we ain't serving you. Uh, you see, even in a place like America, you say, I never thought I would see churches fined for being open. Pastors fined for having church. It's happening. You never thought you'd see people getting take to jail for not wearing a mask out in the open. I've seen it happen. I've seen a guy get arrested the other day who had a mask on, but his child didn't. And they arrested him. They are beating Americans into submission. They are teaching you submission. And it's all preparing you for this global, one-world government, one-world system, cashless society, where they can implement this mark of the beast. And if you say no, you're done. Your chip is off. Your car don't work. You can't buy or sell. You starve to death. You don't comply. And guess what? You're a terrorist then. You're one of those terrorist hate speakers. And they cut your head off. You're, you're ultimately killed for the, for the name of Christ. Because guess what? Nobody but a Christian is going to fight that. Nobody but a Christian. I mean, if you're not saved, you're just going to, all right, I'll just say it, right? I mean, if they said bow down to Satan and you're not saved, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be like, well, I'll just bow down. I don't have to mean it. I can just bow down. Who cares? I'm just going to go get my food. That's what people would say. That's what people say now. They, I've, uh, multiple people, I know masks don't work, but I'm just going to wear it anyway. I know, I mean, that's just the mentality people have. They will do anything they can so long as it's within reason to keep the peace and just move on. And this is going to happen with many people who were unsaved in the tribulation period. And when they take that mark of the beast, they can't be saved anymore. That seals their fate. That's proven in the book of Revelation. It says that the same who uh, take the mark... It says that their smoke and torment will go up forever and ever. Uh, the same person who takes that mark of the beast. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 4, picking back up before I got into that uh, rant there, um, it talks about these people beheaded for the witness of Christ, which I think could be very well soon, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, Maybe they didn't have their forced vaccination, and so they couldn't, they couldn't have their, their chip turned on to go to Food City. It says, and they, it says, these people were resurrected, right? They lived, it says, and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that take, uh, hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Note how it says the second death has no power. The first death does. You say, well, what's the first death? Your physical body. Everybody, if the Lord tarries and you're not caught up in the rapture, we will die eventually. I hate it. You hate it. We dread it. We all dread it. Nobody wants it. It's unnatural. Nobody wants to die. But if the Lord tarries, we will all die in the first death. But the hope of the Christian, the hope laid up for us in heaven is that we, the second death has no power over us. We are not at the second death. We're not going to be judged guilty before the great white throne. We're not going to be thrown in hellfire to burn and to die for all eternity. 
that's not our hope, that's not our future, but this is the last uh, and the third group of people, uh, the third uh, group I want to talk about. This is the second resurrection. And a lot of people don't understand that the unsaved people also have a resurrection. Unsaved people will be resurrected. And a lot of people don't understand that. But listen to John 5, verse 28 and 29. Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. And, when, and now, you ever hear Jesus in the gospel say, the hour is coming and now is, is sometimes what he says. Here he don't say, the hour is coming and now is. Because guess what? It wasn't the time for it. He said, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is a resurrection of damnation. You say, well, show me that. If you're still in Revelation 20, look down at verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up, this is the resurrection part, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, it says, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. In other words, it's saying those, those who wasn't, uh, you know, resurrected by this point, everybody at the great white throne goes to hell. This is essentially a 100% failure rate. Because if you're, the point here is this. If you're judged on your works, if you're judged based off your deeds, you're going to go to hell. Because we're not going to go to heaven based off our works. We're going to heaven based off Jesus' works. We're judged on the basis of him, on his righteousness and perfection. He died for our sins on the cross. He was resurrected. He ascended to heaven. He uh, advocates for us to God the Father. It's him that we look to, not to ourselves, but for these people, they look to their own works. They're going to be judged by their works, and they're going to be found guilty. They are resurrected, uh, resurrected unto damnation. Now, that ain't much to hope for. That's actually horrifying. And um, it really causes us, I think it should, to, to be even more thankful for our salvation. Because we're good? No. Because Jesus Christ is our Savior. And this is really gets down to the last part here that I want to talk about. Do these people have hope? Absolutely. They have hope. I'm going to turn back to Colossians 1 here. Looking at verses 5 and 6, we're going to look at the gospel call now. So we have this hope laid up for us in heaven. We have this future to look forward to that Paul talks about. We have a future resurrection body and a new heaven and a new earth, and we get to reign and rule with Christ on earth for a thousand years, and we become uh, kings and priests unto God. We have all this great uh, future to look forward to, but there's so many people that don't have that future. There's, and the, the love that I talked about earlier, the love that's in us, compels us to want other people to have that future. You responded to the gospel call. The Bible says that we have that hope laid up for us in heaven. It says, Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you, it says, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. Note how it says it goes out into all the world. You know, the call comes to you know everybody, and the call is to come and drink freely of the water of life. That's the way Revelation ends. It says, if you're thirsty, come. It says the spirit and the bride say, come. Now note how it says the bride. The bride would be the bride of Christ, the church. Hey, hey if you want to be saved, you can be saved. God's not saying you can't be saved yet. No, you can be saved. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. The call to deny your own self-righteousness, the call that has went out to all the world, Paul says in verse 6, is the call to deny yourself and to believe on the one who is good, to believe on Jesus Christ. You're not good. You'll never be good. It don't matter how good you think you was yesterday or how good you want to be tomorrow. You're never going to be good enough to be saved. The good news is, is even though you're a sinner, there is a Savior. And this hope, this hope that every Christian has, it's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a knowledge. We know that we're sinners and we trust in Christ. And so that leads us to have the hope. And that's, it, here's the thing. It's not just that it bears fruit of salvation. 
Paul says here that it bears fruit not just in them, but in all the world. It's not just that it brings fruit of salvation. I think that's the primary fruit. The primary fruit of believing in Christ, obviously, is going to be salvation. It's saving, saving faith in, in God and that hope laid up and you begin to set your mind on things above. That is the primary fruit of salvation, you could say here. Uh, it's to know the gospel of grace, of the grace of God and truth. And I'll tell you what, you, you might think, it, well, of course salvation is by faith alone. You know, that's why we always really think about it. And I, I don't think there's a person that, that's been to this church or even in here today that, that would say, well, I think salvation is by works. No, it's just rare around here uh, by people that go to church at least. Most people wouldn't say that. But I tell you what, people on the Internet that I've run into definitely do. Those people are out there, and they do think that they're Christians. I had a person just the other day on the Internet scoff at me and say that I was a heretic for teaching salvation by grace through faith alone. And it's just the primary doctrine of the Bible. And so these people are out there, and they're so deceived that they, they really do think you have to quit sins and you have to be good. And, you know, the gospel fruit that goes out in all the world, it, it's, a, it's a fruit that leads to a changed life. It's a fruit that leads to a knowledge of salvation. But you don't get that salvation by being good. And there's a lot of people that really are deceived like that. And they're deceived because there is the truth that the gospel transforms you. That the, that the gospel, upon believing it, will transform you. You ever heard the, the song, Come uh, Just As I Am? That's true. It's a good song. Now, you come just as you are, but you don't stay that way. There's a doctrine out there in independent Baptist churches, I come just as I am, and I stay just as I am. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You come just as you are, salvation by grace through faith. You come, here I am, Lord. I'm a sinner. I'm a wretch. And you beat your chest like Jesus talks about. Remember, he, he said, guess who went home justified? The guy who beat his chest and said, be merciful to me, God. I'm a sinner. The person who confesses they're a sinner, not the person who quits all their sins. But you see the evangelical Christianity today, many churches will say this. Many preachers will say this. If you listen to the words, you can hear it. 